Sorry, I'm just so glad that you I did. never feel my phone. My phone was in my whole butt pocket. I don't feel it. Oh, well, Anna. I don't know why. Sorry. <laughs> That's funny. Hello and welcome back to Talking Stories with Raquel. This is a story where a show where we talk about the stories that impact lives and inspire change. I'm your host, Raquel Russell, and I wanted to say happy Black History Month. It is February. It is time like I'm so happy that we're here. We made it. We are trying to just uplift and recognize the contributions of Black Canadians, Black Americans, Black people around the world in the diaspora. Um, so thank you again for listening and supporting this podcast by subscribing to the show. Uh, make sure to follow us on our social media channels and reach out. I love to hear from you. Love to hear your feedback. Um, and just trying to, again, make this show something that you enjoy, something that uplifts you um, and helps to inspire you as you go about your walk in this daily life. So our next guest is um, someone that I'm really, really excited to welcome today. Um, she has been on my list uh, of desired interviewees for a minute. Um, and coincidentally, she is one of my best friends. Um, I've known her pretty much all my life. Like I say pretty much because she's a year younger than me. So that's the only year I didn't know her. Um, she is a writer, a communications professional, a fellow podcaster of a great show called These Are My Twenties. And there's so much more to her. Um, I will let her introduce herself soon, but just keep listening uh, before we get in. Anna, welcome to Talking Stories with Raquel Russell. How are you? Hey, friend. I'm good. Thank you for inviting me. I've been, since we've last spoken, I've been thinking about this. So I'm very excited. Honestly, I... I am glad to have you here for so many reasons. Just one, because one of the things that I love about talking to folks that I know is that there's there's that camaraderie already, but um, I want to like even get to know some of the things about you that maybe I don't know. I know it's been 26 years. 25, 25, 25 girl. Girl, you're turning 26 soon. Don't even fret. <laughs> don't even get me started. <laughs> Do not even, I said, you know what? I said after the year that we had, According to the feds, I might be 26, but I'm turning 25 again. I feel no ways. I feel no ways. Cause no. no. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry. 25 years. <laughs> um, I, and I'm just really looking forward to this, this conversation. So let's get right into it. Um, at the top, I did a bit of an introduction to who you are, but in your words, who is Anna Koto? That's a great question. Um, I would say Anna Okoto is a person who is just trying to figure it out. Um, also is a person who values community and living enjoyment. I always say to people, I'm like, my middle name is enjoyment. If we're not having a good time, what are we doing? It's like, come on, point blank period. Um, and I think that's it. Someone who is just trying to figure it out, loves community, um, and loves having a good time. That's really, Beautiful. that's so basic, but you know what? It is what it is. It's true. I, I love, I love how simple it is and just getting to the point of this life and we should not be walking through it. Just, I don't know, like the hustle has become something that people I think are so, um, not obviously not everybody, but people get transfixed with this idea of just hustle culture. Um, and, and I love that you prioritize um, your well-being and again, enjoying life um, as much as you can. So, so that's, that's beautiful. Um, okay. One of the things that I want to get into today was talking about stories that have made a difference in your life. And, um, you know, even thinking about Black History Month and all of the, the different storytelling that's happened um, as a result of, of either um, the accomplishments of the Black community, you know, obviously there's that line of suffering um, and the stories that have come out of all of that that we don't always want to be fixated on. Um, but I'm just curious to hear from you, um, especially for the show where we focus on storytelling, what are some of the important stories um, that you tell yourself or, or, or stories that you like to dig into? Okay. So for me, I feel like for the past for three, four years, I've been very intentional about consuming work um, produced by Black women um, and also work that highlights the experience of a Black woman. So um, whether it be in love, whether it be in, you know, whatever career they're working in, whether it be in, I don't know, self-help, whatever, just making, ensuring that the 
the author as a black woman that's something that I like I do I think also as well consuming like what am I even singing no no you're on the I'm I'm, I'm with you <laughs> ew I feel <laughs> dumb okay let me think <laughs> it's so funny it's because I'm always the other side, right? Right. right yeah. So it's like sitting here, I'm like, oh my gosh, what stuff do I? What if do I actually? Friends, see, and the it's one so I different. At the top of this, um, for folks, just for context, both Anna and I went to journalism school, so we're we're both, you know, used to doing the interviewing side of things, um, and it's still like even now, both of us in this in the communications field, like I think journalism is part of that lifeblood of training something that hasn't really been able to go away um, it doesn't yeah yeah it so doesn't. it's hard to answer now isn't it yeah but let me try we're gonna do what we're gonna ease into it where this is gonna be a journey this whole interview okay. so like I said I've been very intentional about consuming art um both like copy text images whatever by black people more specifically black women um and I feel like a lot the reason I did that is and we'll get into it but I feel like growing up I didn't really get to enjoy that or have experience that maybe um other black women my age had and I think that goes to my parents both being immigrants also coming from West Africa and that's just how colonization has like shaped their view of blackness so I didn't really do a lot of you know like I said digesting with any black text or black art per se unless it was gospel music that was pretty much it <laughs> but um yeah so for the past three four years I was like no like I want to consume work that is made by people who look like me and also sometimes it's not but also made for people who look like me um so yeah that's me I, I love that, that you spoke to that and, and the decision that you made about um, being intentional in that way. I think um, I would say it's similar. Uh, I've had a similar experience, at least, especially like seeing um, the readings that you've been looking at, um, the different people in my sphere, because I'm very conscious. And I, and I, was, I was speaking about this with, um, I believe it was Jody or, or Robin in our earlier episodes, make sure to tune into the earlier episodes, folks, um, about the fact that so much of um, my reading and exposure was often from white voices. And I don't think it mm -hmm. really hit me until, you know, probably my 20s. And I, and I sat right. and looked at my bookshelf and it was like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> right. When I tell you there are some titles that I'm embarrassed to have because no, I but it's true. Oh, wait, what? Right. Yeah. No, it's so true because even when we're talking about like, oh, like come on podcasts we're gonna talk about, I was like thinking, I'm like, what kind of like things that I consume where I feel like kind of shaped my childhood? And I was like, honestly, I didn't really consume anything. And I don't even know if that I was even it wasn't intentional and it wasn't even done out of being hating being black or not wanting to be it wasn't even that I think just honestly I feel like it's the influence of my parents just kind of how blackness is viewed in there from their perspectives mm -hmm. that it just wasn't pushed to celebrate mm -hmm. that you know what I mean so it was just like you're just gonna get whatever is available on television and you if you, I don't know if you, all of your audience is Canadian, but like CanCon, it's not, there's not a lot of us in it. You know what I mean? So um, I just didn't really, you know, read or was exposed to that. But what's funny is that I feel like <laughs> looking, I'm also the type of person where I don't realize things until I'm in it right. or until I'm out of it. Okay. Of course, hindsight's 2020. So yeah. Like for example, I'm going ahead of myself, but stop me if I'm going too far. But like, for example, I did not understand or I did not fully fathom how great Proud Family was as a show until I was older. Like I knew it was like funny. Yeah, but you didn't like take right. it. Right. Yeah, 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 okay. Right, like I was like, oh, this is funny. It's jokes, okay, yeah, like oh, Proud Family's not great. But it wasn't until I got older that I was like, no, like, this was what it was hilarious, but it also spoke to the black experience. Like I didn't re like, and it was, at least for me, I can see like some aspects of my family or even my friend's family and stuff like that. So I think that 
you, I, at least for me, like I said, I didn't realize, oh, like there were actually certain, although yes, a lot of the stuff that I consume was white, mm-hmm. but growing up, I'm able to see like little pockets of, oh, actually there was some stuff that was good, not good, but like there was some stuff that actually spoke to my experience. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah, yeah no, that's, that answers. That's, that's definitely helpful. And I think, as you said, we'll, we'll dig a little bit more into like some of those, um, those stories, those shows that, you know, you appreciate now when you're older, a little bit later. Um, but I wanted to, to come back a little bit to, you were speaking about, um, again, specifically consuming work by, um, uh, people that look like you, specifically Black women, Black writers. Um, and I know one of the books that you recently read um, and wrote a lovely piece about. Um, oh, you're was, so sweet. Oh my gosh. I love that piece. Like, honestly, yeah. anytime I think about this book, which is All About Love by Bell Hooks, I think about your your piece because I myself recently read the book um, and I, I, I heard about it because of you, because you were reading it. Um, and then, um, our mutual friend Raquel gave it to me, um, all about love. And, and honestly, I, I had never heard of Bell Hooks before. And I really, I never heard of her like, well, okay. Okay. This is a lie. This is a lie. So I would see people refer to her, but I didn't know who she was. I didn't know she was like, okay, this, this feminist writer, um, like, right. I had no conception of her. And, and again, this goes to me where I'm trying to build up my, um, my what would you say my reading experience or the books that I'm consuming trying to read more black authors and black thought because a lot of times you know something that you kind of touched on earlier is and I don't want to like just put a a blame at the people who you know were leading around me but black thought like black liberation girl feminism was a dirty word (laughs) Right. <laughs> there were th- these these ideas that I, I feel like I'm doing a lot of catch up on. Um, and, I, and I don't think that we're unique in that because at least I remember when I posted about this book to my to my Instagram account, um, I had a lot of people saying things to the effect of, oh, I read this in grad school um, and like really in this college post, you know, high school reading, which which I guess kind of makes sense. Right. Um, but yeah, just really trying to um, expose myself to to different thoughts and and I thought it was an incredible work and I, I don't want to talk too much about it because I want to let you speak to your experience um, discovering this book, um, reading it and then writing about it because that piece was incredible. You're so sweet. So it was referred to me by um, my friend Keisha um, and another our coworker Farhea, I'm going to name drop them. So I actually, for in university, I did my internship at an art gallery. And the great thing about this art gallery is that it was ran by Black people and it was for Black people. So it just hosted Black visual art. This is what I mean when I was talking earlier, referring to, I kind of went on like a, oh no, like we're going to be intentional about, you know, being involved in my community and uplifting and just, you know, advancing black work so I did my internship at an art gallery we were working one day and I don't even know how it came up in conversation but because both of them had read it came up in conversation like oh my gosh um all about love by bell hooks and they were like going off and I was like I've never read it so um they're like no you need to read this book and this was in 2018 okay they're like you need to read this book it's gonna change your life like it really changed my whole perspective on love, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, bet. I'm going to get it. Forgot. Didn't even think about it. Then it wasn't until last year when I needed to purchase a book for um, church that I was like, oh, like, Bell Hooks, all about love. This was recommended to me. Let me pick it up. Might as well. So I grabbed it. And I remember, got it, and I tried to read it, and I couldn't really get into it, so I stopped. And I was like, I know this book is going to be good, I just need to get myself in the right like headspace mm. and mind frame. So um, I think a couple of months later, started reading it, and from chapter one, Bell was coming for me, and I said, "Ma'am, you're doing a lot. You're doing a lot." But that book really uncovered, or it really uncovered what I think. 
I don't want to say past hurt necessarily, but it just gave me language in order for me to explain how I felt about love and relationship and not just, I should say, not just romantic love, but love between me and my parents, love between me and my brother, love between my friends and all that jazz. So um, throughout reading that book, I had to do a lot of work in, you know, kind of rewiring and also, you know, embracing love because I wasn't, I wasn't. Yeah, I remember when you were, when you were not, not so much when you were going through the book, but when you sent me the piece um, that you wrote for neverapart.com, do you want to speak to the, the group that you wrote for? Yeah, sure. So I, my friend Keisha, the girl who told me to read about the book, she has an organization called Collective Culture, and it is a platform that supports the voices of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, and it's kind of based in between two cities, both Toronto and Montreal. And um, Collective Culture has had a history with Never Part in hosting events and collaboration. So um, we, Collective Culture, has a column in Never Part magazine. So um, Keisha, sorry, Keisha asked, let me try that. So Keisha asked me to write for it. And I was like, okay, girl, like, yeah, whatever. And it's funny, actually, prior to that, I had made an Insta story talking about um, the book. And I was like, everyone needs to read this. And she asked me to write, but I just didn't see it. So when she circled back with me in October, she's like, oh, no, like, I want you to write. I said, okay, sure, I'll do it. And I didn't necessarily know, like, what my approach was going to be. Um, Cause I, you know, imposter syndrome, I don't think I'd be the best writer sometimes, you know? So I was like, I don't know what this is going to be, but like what I do know, or like what I know what I can speak to is my experience and how, mm -hmm. you know, the book help, has helped me and, you know, gave me perspective on things. So that's what I did. So that piece, I pretty much talk about you know, my relationship with love prior to reading the book. And like I mentioned a little bit earlier, your girl is not having it. And like in all, in all things, especially romantic, I was like, bun this, like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And so um, I start off talking about that. And then I also talk about, you know, my childhood because um, I was like, love between like, my parents are cool, like, but can I say I love them? I don't know. And part of me was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that. But I'm like, no, because it's frank. And I feel like I, I'm not the only person who's going through it. Mm -hmm. So I, we talk, I touched on that a bit. And um, I was like, yeah, I think the only person that I really love, honestly, is my brother. And like, I can say like, I love live music. Like I love. So um, are we, are we, are we, Cool with this? Are we okay? Yeah, you're good. Okay. You're good. <laughs> okay, cool. Don't stop. At least I can be guessing. Okay. Don't stop this. You're good. So then I think the first discovery that I had while reading the book was that, you know, love, first of all, was the definition of love. And Bell Hooks says that love is, I'm going to pull it up actually, because I'm, I can't. Um, Here, let me throw it to you in the chat for anyone listening on Zoom right now. Yes. So she says, oh, here we are. And take your time. I, I can just edit the dead silence. Edit this? Okay. Mm. I'll try and go back to the position I was in. So at least it'll be nice, a straight cut. Okay. So um, one, two, excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. You're okay. Excuse me. Sorry. I'm burping. Woo. <laughs> okay. So the first thing I would say I learned was honestly that love is a verb. Like love is active. It's not passive. And I really enjoyed Bell's discussion. Um, Bell's description. What am I saying? I really enjoyed Bell's definition of love and she actually borrowed it from another book by M. Scott Peck. I think it's called The Road Less Traveled. And she says, love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another spiritual growth. Mm. And I was like, I can't mm. say that uh, I'm doing that in all of my relationships. And even then, 
I'm comfortable with this, this um, definition because right. I was just like, the things that people are saying in either my life and just in the world are saying that this is love. I was like, no, like it, it's not like if, and it, or if that's it, no, thanks. You can miss me with all of that. And like, um, like I said, this is also very active and I like, I don't know about y'all, but like when people, if there's something happening in the world in regards to like social justice, whatever, and people are like, love is the answer. Like, just love everyone. I'm like, shut up. Like, talk about it. Yeah. I was like, no, like, no, but I'm like, but according to this definition, I would mm -hmm. agree. Mm -hmm. Love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. And I was like, yeah, that's not something that people fall into. It's very intentional. It has a vision. And I was like, okay, if this is the case, and we all know that there are so many benefits to love, then like, I'm going to make a decision today to operate out of a place of love, right. or at least operate in the hopes of getting to, you know, that place of love. I think so, to it is, is a love ethic. Yeah. It was yeah. It really kept standing out to me. Love ethic. Exactly. A love ethic. So it started off with me like recognizing, okay, I have to like, I've learned this new definition. Okay. How can I come to terms with what I've experienced so far? And, um, Belle talks about how, especially in the black community, she was just talking about how like love is confused with care or people say mm -hmm. that love is care. And I was like, Ooh, girl, yes. Like I can understand that because talking of like for my parents we even black whatever your background is mm -hmm. your parents will always you know, there's a roof over your head you have food to eat you have clothes to wear you're in school that's love but if you really think about it that's not the only like that's a part like I said that it's an right. aspect it's an ingredient but it's not actually love so mm -hmm. when I was like oh okay cool I understand this, this makes sense. Now let's start like, you know, making, let's start making, I don't wanna say making changes because it's not like boom, something happened and I'm like, I'm free. Like, it's not that, it's definitely okay. a, a yeah. daily practice, but it was like, okay, I have this information now I need to like, or at least I felt called to act accordingly. So um, it made me reevaluate other aspects of my life. So like I said, romantic relationships and, you know, kind of situations I was finding myself in and um, thinking that it was one thing when it really wasn't. Um, and then also when it came to my work and wanting to um, do work that mattered to me and be right. working in a loving environment yeah, um, and finding language in order to um, state that that's what I desire or even when it comes to like, you know, I didn't have to, my contract was fine, but like I could assume for other people, depending on your line of work, like if there's, you know, in regards to like time off you can have or hours of operation or whatever, like it was like, I need to ensure that love is flowing in every aspect of my life so that I can, you know, have this environment for it to thrive. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the journey that the book has taken me on yeah. like I said it's a daily practice and I don't want it to sound like I've arrived girl I definitely have not like you know I've just I've read the book it really like you know gave me perspective and thinking and then has I felt propelled me to move different so yeah yeah, yeah. I I love that and thank you for speaking to, to the experience of reading it um and writing and reflecting because I think as, as we know, like writing and, and for anyone listening who's a writer, writing is such a, a reflective practice. You know, it helps you to, to go back and say like, this is what I've, um, what I've actually downloaded into myself um, and what I can begin to apply. And I think that's something that I'm, I'm hoping to do because what, what I loved about reading this book is I actually read it as a collective with folks. Like Clubhouse, this new app, um, allows you just to like read or have these these audio meetings with people. And every night for a couple of weeks, I was reading it out loud. And I made a new friend through that. And she was a big fan of, of Bell Hooks as well. Like she's read a lot of her works. 
Um, and, and, and to be able to see how her work has touched people at different places in their lives. Like for her, she, she read the book. Um, this is her second time reading it. Um, or sorry, I think it was her third time reading it. Um, and I know that now, like I said, on Instagram, I'm probably going to be returning to this book every single year because there's just so much to, to, um, to yeah. really take in. And I don't think that you can get it all yeah. um, in one, in one scoop. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, thank you for speaking to that. I'm going to, but I'm going to tag on that still, but because I, I feel like even, I feel like it's one of those books that depending on the time of your life, you'll have to definitely return to it. Like, for example, one thing that really hit me that it's not in the article, but I was like, it made me rethink was actually children mm. because, and it was the chapter where she's talking about justice Yeah, and how like essentially for, and it makes sense, at least to me, I was like, I get it. And it's like, children don't really have agency. Like people think that, oh, they're your child. Like you bore them. So like you have, you know, kind of control over them. And I was like, like, I get why people feel like they have that power because right. they birthed a child. But at the end of the day, that person is their own human being. Like they are their own person. So like you can guide them, you know, like you can guide them and you can, you know, at, like speak to them or suggest things to them in order to decisions in order to help them make decisions and stuff but like you can't control them and I was like mm -hmm. knowing I, I don't know if I want to have my own biological children but mm -hmm. I was just like if I decide to do that my approach my approach to parenting is definitely going to be much different than I think other people's approaches and also I need to ensure that I have a partner who is willing to do that work with me because it's right. going to be very different than I know for, I can see for myself very different from my childhood so I need someone who is willing to make the, do the work on themselves hmm. and then also be doing the work with me and raising the children or child. This, this kind of um framework that you're speaking to right yeah I think one of the things that I kept thinking about with this book is this would be a book that I would want to give that hypothetical person that I'm dating to like read. Like, <laughs> Girl, this will be a great, uh, uh, this will determine this. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm, do, I don't care. I don't, I'm gifting that. Like, I don't, any opportunity for me to gift that book, I do it. Like, for example, I, I did a uh, this mass like book exchange thing you best believe one of the books I put in the person's name was all about love because I just feel like it brings perspective and it's that's it like I, it just presented ideas and concepts that I hadn't really necessarily um, thought about and then yeah. also maybe some like concepts I've made up in my head it also provided me with language mm -hmm. so I think it's just a book I, a girl it's my partner I'm just saying, sir. I'm just saying. I think one, if the person does not consume or read anything by women, right? Then like I'm already like it's like a little bit of a red flag. This isn't gonna work, you know. But if you already yeah. consume with that, I'm gonna be like, let me slide this to you, sir, and see what your thoughts are. Here you go. We'll go from there. We're yeah. reading. Well, oh, that's my son. Sorry, baby Yoda just fell over. Oh, bye. Him down. Um, yeah. So we're big fans of Bell Hooks. It looks like I should keep that on my list of next gifts to get you for your birthday of like a new Bell Hooks book. Any, any um, books, period. <laughs> her stuff is so good. Um, but yeah, I mean, as we've been talking, we've been talking about um, Bell Hooks again, who is a, a black feminist writer. Um, and she's obviously left her mark on so many people. I think one of the other people that also was a fan of her that I remember seeing talk was um, written by Hannah. Um, I think you follow her as well on Twitter. Um, she's she's written by, like her name's Hannah, but like her ads written by Hannah. Right, but Hannah. She, she's so. hilarious. Oh my gosh, she's one of my favorite people online, but she's yeah, also a big her. fan of her. Um, but I mean, I think one thing that I've seen, um, especially through social media um, the last several years, uh, obviously like we're in a pandemic right now. So a lot of the conversations that we're having are digital and online is just the importance of storytelling um, for, um, for culture, um, especially um, during Black History Month, we see that highlighted. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll preface this a bit in saying that um, I know that with West Indian cultures, especially like even African-American cult, Black cultures, like 
the importance of storytelling is something that has been passed on through 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 history you know from being taken from slave ships and being dropped off at our different places i always i always try to highlight that because people get caught up on what country we got dropped off at we all got dropped off somewhere from another place obviously built our cultures but um coming yeah. back to to the continent and like just the importance of stories and, and oral histories and how things are passed down. And I just wanted to give you a chance to even speak to the importance of, of storytelling in your culture, if how you've seen that played out. I mean, obviously we both grew up here in Canada. Right. Um, like we're like, my parents are Jamaican background. Um, uh, Anna's family is from Ghana background. Um, but one of the things that I remember, like even when we were kids, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, we both went to tree class, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we both did that. And it was like, I remember um, they were talking about a Nancy story. Yes. Uh, Nancy the like Nancy the Spider. And, and I was, I'm listening to these stories and I'm like, I know these stories because my dad would tell them to me growing up as a kid, like a Nancy the Spider and Nancy the, the trickster, the trickster God, like you would, you would hear different versions of these stories. And, um, and then it was interesting to hear about it from again yen perspective um and like see how they kind of intersect and i think that was my first kind of um real understanding of of how much was passed down um right through 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 history orally because right it wasn't like we had the internet <laughs> you know right. no so it's, it's true funny. it's true it, yeah. it, it low-key worries me because the last the, my first time ever going to ghana was 2018 2018, 2020. Okay. Yeah. 2018 it was the first time we went. And I remember one of the days it was such a random, like it wasn't planned on our agenda, but my dad got a call from, I think he's my dad's cousin. And he's like, Oh, like, do you want to come to Cole Nemo's house? And Cole Nemo, my dad's like, Cole Nemo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're going to come. Like what time? Like, what? And I was like, who's this guy? Like, let's, I mean, I'm just like, let's go. Like, you know what I mean? So my dad's like, Cole Nemo is a folk, Ghanaian folk singer. Mm. And he, at one point of his life, he was, he would sing, like, sing to the kings. Like they would call him to come to the house and perform essentially and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so my dad's like, this guy's like a big deal. So it was my dad, Joshua, my younger brother, myself and my uncle, we drove down. And so we went to his house and Cone was like probably in his like late seventies or early eighties. Wow. And, um, he we went to his house and we sat down and he had like all of his instruments and tons of books. Wow. And like, we were sitting there and my, I had just come to learn about him, but my dad and my uncle were like mesmerized. And we spent, I don't know how many hours, I recorded the whole thing because my dad was adamant on like keeping all of this. Yeah, of but he was pretty much talking about like a sense of history with us and talking about how like the lineage and you know, what happened and different battles that happened. And he, he was telling us all of these stories off this top of his dome and I was like are there books because he's getting older and I feel like even coming down to language as well like mm -hmm. I feel like my parents speak tree mm -hmm. I can understand it I can speak it a little bit but like after my parents if I don't uphold it that's gonna be lost and my kids aren't gonna and I was born here in Canada so I was thinking like this gentleman who's older and he doesn't have a protege um he doesn't have I don't know if he has children or whatever, but like, it seems to be like there's no interest in that history because everyone is kind of, you know, doing their own thing. Like, for example, I feel like, bro, I, I cried that night. That's how oh I'm like, God. so, because he was supposed to have a radio interview and they just didn't pick him up, right? And I was like, this is an opportunity, right? I don't know, right? So I was just like, this isn't like, this person has so much information and obviously is talented in music, but like people aren't, he's not given at least opportunities now right. to share these stories. And he told me like he wrote books and stuff and he was working on someone with someone to get a book and he's had a couple published, but there's some, there's one book that he wrote that it's, I don't, I'm, this was two years or almost three, three years ago. So I don't really remember the details, but it was being held for some reason and had all this info. And I was like, 
we either need to like we really need to document stories we need to like take account like it's imperative in order for us to know you know where we come from because anything anyone can tell you anything that's why we have textbooks in schools that aren't telling accurate history you know what i mean like it's important that people of cultures that they control or they document things and control narratives so that you know, things aren't getting lost in the sauce. So um, yeah, I just, I feel like that moment definitely changed things within me to be like, I need to in any way possible preserve any sort of culture or literary text Mm. that is definitely by Ganyans, but just people specifically black people wherever you are on the globe could like preserve that. Preserve, that's the word that yeah, I, I've been thinking about it a lot because um, in my like my nine to five job, I work at the U of T Scarborough Library, and one of the initiatives that we have right right now for the month of February is Black History Wikipedia Editathon, and we have this amazing speaker um, who's the UTC writer in residence, Elle Jones, who's an abolitionist. She's a journalist. She's a poet, um, uh, activist, and and she she was writing these these she shared these pieces, these spoken word performances where um, it just reminds you again of the importance of what you said, preserving our histories. Um, she's more of a fan of the, uh, uh, correct me if I'm saying the word wrong, a f- a I never say it right. Like <laughs> basically like not written down, um, yeah. but she also acknowledges the importance of it because then you you go through time, you know, and, and if you don't have it written down somewhere, someone else can change that history for you. And I think what right. I appreciate about the, the edit-a-thon and, 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 and edit-a-thons like this that are happening around the world is allowing people to have the power to document um, their stories um, and so that that the generations afterwards are able to hear about these different things because I mean uh, I don't want to go too much into this because I talked about it last week but even things like Black Panther right um, mm-hmm. it showed this hunger for stories that centered um, Black people and Black people that were like it wasn't so much centering pain of, right. of, of, of Black people because you see so much and I'm glad there's criticism happening about like the movies that make a bunch of money, you know, are the 12 Years a Slave or, um, uh, you know, not shading Roots because Roots is important, but like these stories of trauma and and right. wanting to be able to go back to, you know, these, these the heritage of, of um, you know, people who are, you know, folk singers, um, um, politicians, you know, leaders, like, I just think it's it's so important. And I think to what you're saying, I, I agree and just trying to like grab anything I can because yeah. even for me, like um, I, I've talked about this with you before, just like you always, there's this displacement feel that you you feel, especially in the diaspora, like, um, and especially for me, like being born here in Canada to Jamaican parents who even came here, like when they were pretty young, like my dad came to Canada right. when he was, I think 10 um, and, even his cultural connection is because he's he was able to go back to Jamaica often his his right. most of the family you know they're Jamaican like my mom was born in England but you would barely know it because she speaks more Patois than anything like I'm like right. what are you doing right now? right um, but there's they even even though they came here when they were young there's there's more of that connection and oftentimes I I start to be concerned about am I being having a diluted um Ex- not like experience because you know our lives are our own and how we we create them but going back to that word you said of preserving and being intentional like I'm trying to be much more intentional now about finding these stories learning these stories obviously I'll never be able to identify the same way as my parents my grandparents my great great grandparents right. but at least I can have that knowledge and pass it down I think I just think that's important yeah I agree I think that and sometimes I, I don't know about you but I'm very much the like for example I was like just for like, if something happens or if I'm seeing a lack in something, I feel like I have to fix it. And like, that's a lot of work, like Mm. that's not. But it's also, I feel like even like helping, like supporting people's efforts to do so. Like it doesn't necessarily, sometimes the stuff isn't written, right? Sometimes it isn't. So it's like, okay, like, is there anyone out there who's trying to do that work and what kind of support do they need? So for example, like there is this Instagram account called C. Hennick, I'm not my English accent girl, but it means um, 
Hannah means king and she. So what this girl, I think she's doing her post-grad in something. And so pretty much she's like archiving um, royals or chief chieftaincies, I think that's the word, like families and different chiefs and stuff in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, that's, I feel like very important work as well, especially in a country that is still very much um, like tribalistic mm. in a sense, like, um, I don't want to say in a sense, but still very much like rooted in I'm me, me, a sense me, but me, sense me, whatever, you know what I mean? So like, um, I feel like it's really important to also aid and support the efforts of people who are doing that work. And um, yeah, I think it's just a conversation that needs to be had. And I understand like, maybe some people are like, yes, I want to, you know, create my own experience and stuff like that. But I'm like, and I, for real, like, do you do yeah, whatever yeah. you want to do? Yeah. You know what I mean? But I think for those who do desire to, you know, be able to look back or be able to, you know, digest material or whatever um, that covers stories like that, like definitely support the efforts of people who are doing so and highlight it. Yeah, I love that you said that because there was this tweet that I came across the other day that was so important in terms of people, stop saying people aren't having the conversation and support the people who are doing, having the conversation and doing the work, but they're just not visible. Right. Um, yeah, no, I think that's so important, like yeah. digging back in and supporting. Awesome. Anna, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm glad that we got to talk about like this historical lens. Um, mm -hmm. And it's important, but I want to pull us into um, what we were talking about a little bit earlier about what are some of those um, those those iconic um, or otherwise, you know, black stories, um, characters, actors that kind of left an impression with you. Mm, that's hard. Like I said, like Proud Family, I think is such a funny show and just such a great like. Oh, uh, like I think it was great, funny, yeah. and yeah, I have had many afternoons as a kid just enjoying that so when I saw it on Disney plus I was like super <laughs> excited um I'm trying to think and I was thinking about this because it goes back to the whole like I didn't really like seek out and nor was it like presented to me like oh yeah. you should also like look at this or watch this or read this but um I know we said this earlier loved the cheetah girls like Raven loved her that's so raven say what you want like i get it 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 trust me i get it but raven was that girl and grazing in the grass was a hit like she she was that girl i think now people that i look to because i feel like that's really where i can yeah draw from that's really hard i feel like i'm, I'm going music based but what I, what I will say is I've been really enjoying even not even just like actual like articles and stuff, but just the work that they're doing. I love Lindsay Peoples Jones. So I don't know if she's moved over to the cut yet, right. but she um, worked to the cut. I forget her role, but then she became a Teen Vogue um, editor in chief. And so she's been doing like amazing work with them, especially in regards to like advocacy, activism, and amplifying the voices of queer folk and like just great work period and so i've been really enjoying you know watching the platforms or her team book platform and how that's been going um also elaine walter i that's it's another book that i really enjoyed you are more than enough or more than enough more than enough that was really good like i really i didn't expect to enjoy that book so much and i think she was the predecessor of lindsay people jones i think uh, lindsay people's wagner i keep on saying lindsay people's jones because i'm thinking about a football player a donovan people's jones oh gosh, yeah, gosh, and he played for perfect. michigan and now he plays for the browns and so people's it's it's because it's a double last name and it starts yeah. with people's but anyway i digress <laughs> but um elaine malteroth um more than enough um also, my friends have been writing cool stuff. My friend Muna just wrote actually an article for Never Apart called I Think I Broke My Brain. Oh, and I, I gotta go read it's it. So good. She was in her, she was in her English bag. Like there's a screenshot I put on my story. It's probably still there. She was pulling all of the similes, and I was like, you better, <laughs> you better hop into that bag. Like it was so good. She's she's great. Um, she's great. I'm trying to think of people I've been 
enjoying like reading a book that I, I don't know if this is answering your question. I yeah, mean, you are. Okay. Just because I don't really have any childhood people, it's a really proud family, Raven. Yeah. And. Well, I mean, we could, I was going to pull into um, Cinderella. I mean, we just. I was thinking to- about that. I was thinking okay. about that, but I feel like that didn't even hit for me as much as a kid. Like I didn't really. No, the breeze. The, no, but this is the thing, Raquel. Right. For me, this is okay. Yeah. We can, maybe we can talk about this. Yeah. For me, Princess Diaries hit so much more harder for me. Okay. Growing up. Okay. Yeah. Then ran, now I feel like I'm really like, over the past few years, I've been like, yes, Brandy. Yes. It doesn't make sense that, you know, your prince is Filipino, but he has a white and a black bear. But like, you know what? It's fine. Like we're here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like now I'm understanding the impact that that has. Yeah. But when I was growing up, no, it was Mia Thermopolis. LOL. You know, you know? what? I can't, even, I can't even front because I I I get what you're saying. Like, um, for context for people, like Princess Diaries was probably our big first big girl movie. Like yeah. we used to watch this every year um, for birthday sleepovers. And then Princess Diaries 2 came in with the beautiful man that is Chris Pine. Okay, but I see, know. this is the thing we did not, cause I was, he was cute, I get it. Okay, no, like no, other no. Dude, I no. like him. You, wait, you don't think he was that cute? Anyways, you know what? I don't think I should let you talk. I'm going to censor you. I'm going to censor you right now because you can't come on here and spread lies. We're going to do a whole Twitter on Trump thing. You're gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't lie. I'm screaming. But like, even, yeah. like, even um, I think with Cinderella um, and, and seeing people like crying about it and everything about how it's, it's coming on streaming, I think it hit because only because I remember it for the braids. The braids were huge. Right. Like right. just being able to wear what you wanted. I remember as a kid, you know, this, it was a white kid who was like calling me Medusa because of my braids. Mm-hmm. And I don't even remember why I knew about Medusa in grade five, but I knew it was an insult of right. some kind before right. I knew the whole, you know, feminist slant on her story right. and everything. Yeah. And I remember that was the one or the one of my earliest memories of a black boy stepping in for me and saying mm-hmm. like, you don't know what braids look like? What right. do you mean? What's wrong with you? And like actually defending me. So I always yeah. associate her, her braids like was yeah. such a big thing for me more than probably, like obviously the soundtrack is bomb. Like I love girl, Period. like they need to hurry up and release that somewhere. Yeah. But um, no, I, I get you. Like, I feel like we had such a, uh, an intimate relationship with Princess Diaries because we, we watched so much. We, we did, but yeah, yeah. I think, I think also I say for me, like I keep on reverting to this, not because I just want context for people to understand, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like my, oh, what was I saying? What was I saying? We're talking You're talking about, about new writers and your upbringing and- Oh yeah, that's why, thank you. Because I was saying, I didn't really get, to, I wasn't really exposed to that as a kid. So mm-hmm. similar to you, like I feel like I've spent probably since I was like 19 doing catch up on things that, you know, people my age would have been listening to or enjoying, especially, I really feel that with music, like mm-hmm. love music. So I feel like I'm definitely going back. Like for example, this wasn't recent, but let's say Beyonce, like Homecoming, right? Those horns, it's a sample from an Outcast song, but I wouldn't know that. Right, right, right. Yeah. I didn't get to list, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of catch up, which is great. It's cool because I get to fully understand and appreciate things now. You know, those yeah. things that you don't really appreciate when you're a kid. But now you look back, you're like, oh, actually, that was pretty dope. So it's nice to have that. But yeah, I didn't really get to um, have those moments as a kid in order for it to have more impact on me. Or and then another, like, a nuanced impact, I guess, for now at my age. That, that makes sense. And honestly, like, my, what I hope is that we continue to just be able to have the time, as much time on this earth, um, to just kind of, like, learn more and 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 dig more and and get more of these new people added to our roster um Mm -hmm. because it it, it's important and it it helps you to have better full-out conversations again especially in this digital world it's easy to like you know you you pick up a lot from you know specifically american black culture british black culture and 
um, you know, Canadian Black culture and seeing like these conversations happening online. And I think that's one of my favorite things about social media, um, being able to learn from each other. And then music, like you're saying, girl, everything you said about homecoming, that that was my experience. Cause half of these right. things were like, oh, I recognize this. And I'm just like, yeah, I love the beat. I don't know where this actually Right, you don't know, from, right. But right. yeah, I am so cognizant of the time because we're we're here kicking and I'm like, hold on, we could probably just go on forever because- We could. That's that's us. Um, but I wanna, I wanna bring us um, back. One last question for you. Um, before we get into some rapid fire questions, what yeah. are what is one story um, that you are really enjoying this year? Um, otherwise, something that's maybe um, uplifting you. It could be a story, it could be a writer. I know you mentioned a few earlier, so maybe you want to just choose one um, that's been carrying you through, especially this pandemic season. I can't even say year anymore because who knows when this is going to end. No, oh, you don't know. Yeah. I'm even trying to think, I feel like it's not really a specific thing, but I feel like just interacting, not even just interacting, but just seeing <laughs> Black people on Twitter and Instagram and the memes and stuff that they come <laughs> up with have me rolling. Like the latest thing is that girl who used Gorilla Glue so to lay her hair. I was like, my girl. How, did she actually get it off? I don't know, but she, you know? I saw something that said she put coconut oil and stuff overnight. So she's going to update us today. But like, see, now that experience is really like, I feel bad. I really hope that it comes out and she has all her hair. But I'm saying just, but just seeing how Black people interact in yeah. the social spaces and then certain things, jokes that are cracked and, yeah. um, like, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking. Oh, I saw this. I saw a tweet this morning, and this girl said, "Oh, I got it. I can't believe I got a 77 percent of plagiarism on my assignment or whatever." And someone quotes you and be like, "You're still saying my?" I was right, <laughs> but like stuff like that, stuff like that, I see on the daily, and it's and it's those things that bring me joy and like yes. push me through so yeah oh my gosh yeah i identify with that twitter is i i tell it say it all the time twitter is probably my favorite app and like just to lurk just to read Same. what people the shenanigans Same. just to, exactly that's it yeah god bless um this has been great, Anna. Thank you so much for talking with me about- Has it? Okay, because the the, we started off slow in the first, but we came back in the we half. Came through, because... We came through. I think it's it, it's good to like get a rhythm because we know you're coming back on again. Like this oh, is- Oh, thanks, sis. This I is, I, psh, LOL. You thought this was a one-time deal? I don't Sorry. Know. <laughs> Sorry to announce it to you here. You'll be back. I'm dead. Um, but yeah, I want to say thank you for that. And we're going to get into some real rapid fire questions. And when I say rapid fire, I mean, you have, you have seconds to respond. Okay. So I'm not giving you time. Okay. Um, I thought I would start with an easier one. This is just for folks to get to know you a little bit more. Um, have fun with it. I know you're a fan of reality TV shows. So um, can you name your favorite reality TV show? Ooh, my favorite. I can't, the first, okay, it's rapid fire. So yes. it's not my favorite, but the last one I watched was the Real, House of, Real Housewives of Atlanta. So. I, yeah, I was kind of. Yeah, <laughs> one of that one, it's just, yeah. Yeah, okay, so what's your favorite place to write? Ooh, my favorite place to write. Or where's your favorite place to write, yeah. Um, I don't know, just anywhere by a large window. Okay, yeah. What is one book on your to read list? Oh my gosh. Which one? There's, when I tell you that there's a lot, I'm even, I'm trying to even think. There's so many that I'm even trying to like pick one. Oh, um, ooh, Beloved by um, Toni Morrison. Yes! Oh my gosh, that's a good one. I need to add that to my list. Yeah. Don't know about that. No, that's so good. Thank you for sharing that. That's a good tip there for no me. Um, last one. How do you prefer to consume your stories? Books or movies or TV shows? Ooh, that's a big one. I feel like more recently, 
I, it's weird. I don't know why quarantine did this, but books, like I, I made it, I don't know why I started reading books more. I, I had more time on my hands, I guess, to do other things. So this year I'm definitely making an effort to purchase and read more books. That's good. Good on the eyes too. Yes. That's true. Anna, thank you for joining me. Where can our listeners, listeners find you? Yeah, you can find me on all social media platforms, Anna, A-N-N-A underscore A-K-O-T-O. I'd say follow me on Instagram because my Twitter is protected because, you know, we work corporate. <laughs> so we're keeping that. But um, Anna underscore Koto. And then also follow Sully's My 20s on Instagram. That will be coming back at Sully's Are My 20s, all one word. Yes, we're so excited to see the next episodes of So These Are My Twenties. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I will talk with you some more offline and I hope everyone goes and listens to Anna's content and follows her on social media. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, y'all. So I hope you all enjoyed that special episode of Talking Stories with Raquel Russell. Anna is a joy to speak to. (laughs) Any excuse I can have to to bring her on this show, believe me, I will find the excuse. But I hope that you you enjoyed. Please subscribe. Please, uh, if if you liked it, share it with a friend, share with a family member. Follow us on our socials on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, Talking Stories with Raquel Russell. And I look forward to seeing you at our next next episode. Keep living your real and keep living your truth. Be safe out there.